Hello there, I'm Joshua Johnson. It's good to be with you on this Friday, September 23rd. And tonight we're talking about a lot of big stories from around the world. Hurricane Fiona is heading toward eastern Canada after hitting Bermuda. We'll see how Nova Scotia is bracing for what could be one of its strongest storms on record. Protests continue across Iran after a young woman died in police custody. How is the Islamic Republic dealing with defiance of its strict dress code? Also tonight, a gripping short documentary on the horrors of the war in Ukraine. Richard Engel takes us inside a makeshift Russian torture chamber and meets a man who survived. There were four people in here. So this underground area is where the Russians and their collaborators kept the political prisoners. Plus, climate change is devastating developing countries. What's the responsibility of developed nations like the U.S.? We'll explore the ongoing crisis in Pakistan. And here in the U.S., the midterm elections are a few months away. Tremaine Lee brings us his latest report on the power of black voters. Let us begin with Hurricane Fiona on its way from the tropics to Canada. Right now, it's on track to hit Nova Scotia tonight. It could be one of the worst storms on record in the Atlantic provinces. Overnight, Fiona hit Bermuda with heavy rain and sustained winds of nearly 125 miles per hour. Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic are still struggling to get everyone reconnected with power and clean water. Meanwhile, another storm is forming in the Caribbean. Forecasters say Tropical Depression 9 could hit South Florida as a hurricane next week. Today, Governor Ron DeSantis declared a state of emergency for 24 counties. NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman starts us off tonight with the latest on these storms. Hey, Michelle. Hey there, Joshua. Great to see you. And we're going to start with Fiona because we do expect landfall early tomorrow morning, already starting to feel the impacts there. And we're looking at a strong storm. We're looking at a big storm with fierce winds. We're going to see a lot of power outages as we head throughout the overnight hours into tomorrow. So here is the latest. We're looking at a Category 3 storm with really strong winds of 125 miles per hour. Keep in mind that it's sustained. They aren't gusts. So we're going to see winds gusting higher than that. Good news is it's moving fast. It's moving at 46 miles per hour. So that is what you want with a storm. Now we're going to see winds gusting very, very high. We're going to see that track, that landfall near Nova Scotia sometime Saturday morning. Keep in mind, we still have a lot of leaves on the trees. It's the first full day of fall. That's going to bring, the winds are going to bring those trees down pretty easily. And we're looking at winds gusting over 109 miles per hour tomorrow, over 80 miles per hour in spots. That's not the only place. We're going to feel the effects also in portions of Maine with winds gusting at tropical force speed, uh, over 46 miles per hour in some spots. Bangor, Maine, 39 miles per hour. Bar Harbor, you're looking at 44. So windy day there. And this will be a historic storm where we're we're going to see really low pressure, could be the lowest pressure they've ever seen. That equates to a really powerful storm and really strong winds. Let's turn our attention to Tropical Depression 9. This will be a very big story over the next few days, at least over the next five days. A Tropical Depression now, that means it has an area, a closed area of low pressure. Doesn't look great on radar and satellite right now, but it will get its act together and we will see a hurricane, could see a major hurricane as early as Tuesday into Wednesday. So we are looking at the location, 410 miles east-southeast of Kingston, Jamaica. Winds are at 35 miles per hour, and it's moving northwest at 15 miles per hour. Notice those winds, 35. We only need 39 to be a tropical storm, and we do expect it to gain its name. That would be Ian later on tonight into Saturday morning. We already have alerts in place. We're looking at Jamaica under a uh, tropical storm watch. We have a hurricane watch for the Cayman Islands. We do expect to see those impacts there Sunday into Monday. Now, as we go throughout time here, really nothing in its way hindering its strengthening. So we do expect it to strengthen. It's right now swirling in really warm Caribbean waters, and the Gulf is really warm too. Bath water. We're looking at temperatures in the 80s. So that's going to help to really strengthen it. And we're going to see that track move towards the north and eventually towards the east. So let's go 
over the timing for you. Right now, a tropical depression later on tonight into Saturday. We do expect it to be a tropical storm. That would be Tropical Storm Ian. And then by uh, sometime Monday, we're going to see a hurricane status. So hurricane uh, category one. And then Joshua, we're watching this very closely because we are expecting a landfall sometime on Wednesday as a major hurricane on the west coast of Florida. Of course, this could change, but that would be the first time in five years. So this is a big deal. Yeah, I got my family's on the east coast of Florida, and they're definitely keeping an eye on what side of that storm may end up in the Palm Beaches and along the Treasure Coast. So we will definitely be watching TD9 very closely. NBC meteorologist Michelle Grossman, thanks for the forecast tonight. We appreciate it. But let's start with Fiona and see how eastern Canada is preparing for that. NBC's Maggie Vespa is in Halifax, Nova Scotia with more. Hey, Maggie. Yeah, we're here in Halifax, Nova Scotia on what is normally a pretty crowded boardwalk here in the kind of the coastal part of this city. But you can see it's completely deserted tonight. Pretty much no one's been out here all day today and officials are actually closing off access later on tonight. One official telling us she can't remember the last time that's happened. At the same time, we've seen people out kind of panic buying things like water, non-perishables, generators, utility companies, staffing up, calling for all hands on deck as people expect power to go out potentially for days on end given uh, Fiona's historic size and strength. Listen in part to what the mayor told us, his advice to people here in Nova Scotia earlier today. Don't go to the water and try to be a big shot. Don't, don't surf. We've got surfing here that, that's, that's great, but don't surf in a hurricane and don't go to Peggy's Cove. Um, you know, pay attention to your own health and it's not just yourself, but Folks may be called upon to rescue you, and that takes efforts away from other things. And, you know, we've been talking to people all around the city throughout the day today, and one woman telling us she's lived in Nova Scotia for a really long time. Obviously, given the location of Halifax, she's seen coastal storms and hurricanes before, but even given that experience, people here are really scared. Noting amid our climate crisis with these warming waters, hurricanes that managed to make it all the way north into Canada are getting all the stronger and the damage all the more severe. Joshua. Thank you, Maggie. That's NBC's Maggie Vespa in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Back in Puerto Rico, nearly a million homes and businesses are still without power. People there are trying their best to clean up from Hurricane Fiona, but the damage is devastating. Not to mention, it's really hot right now. Tonight's heat index in San Juan feels like the low 90s. NBC's Ellison Barber joins us now from Bayamón, among Puerto Rico's northern coast, with the latest. Ellison, how are things going there tonight? Joshua, you said it, there is still, there are still a lot of people spending another night in the dark and the heat index the last few days, it has just been unbearable. Today, the heat index was about 102 degrees. People are at home without AC, oftentimes without running water. The light that you see where we're standing right now, all of this is our light. It's coming from the headlights on our cars and flashlights that we have here because there are still about two thirds uh, of this island in just total darkness without power. Two thirds of the homes and businesses on this island have no power. So uh, the crews, utility crews, they're out working, trying to restore it. But part of the problem, they say, is stuff like this. Come with me and I will show you. So we are literally standing on what was a highway. You can see here with this flashlight I have, this is asphalt where there was a mudslide here. It took out this highway. So this road, this area is completely impassable. The power company here, the main power company, Luma, they say they have about 2,000 uh, utility crew members on the ground trying to get power restored. There are a lot of systemic issues as it relates to the power grid. A lot of issues there. There are multiple layers of problems here, but one very obvious surface level problem they're running into are things like this. They say that they have crews coming out trying to get to different lines to make some repairs and get the power back on, but they're running into things like this, roads that literally no longer exist and they can't get to some of the infrastructure, the transmission lines, the utility poles that they need to repair because of it. On top of that, in a lot of places, there's still just a lot of debris covering the road and clearing all of that has to happen before those crews can access some of the things they need to fix. But people here, they are frustrated. It's been days without power and the conditions in terms of the heat, it's making everything just much more challenging for people to survive it. It's mentally challenging and physically as well, particularly when you have people going out and trying to clean up debris around their own homes. Joshua.
Yeah, you kind of got to my next question, Ellison, which is how people are doing and particularly how they're getting by from day to day. We were talking to Gabe Gutierrez earlier this week from Puerto Rico about just how people are managing to feed themselves and to flush toilets and to do all those kinds of things. What are people telling you in terms of how they're getting by day to day until all these services are restored? You know, it varies a lot by cities, right? Like San Juan, big cities, they have power on their restaurants, people kind of going about normal life, if you will. But in most of the other parts of the islands, that's not the case. And a few days ago, we were driving and along the highway, we stopped and we spent all day talking to people there because we saw people who were jerry-rigging PCV pipes, just like those plastic pipes you can buy at any Home Depot or Lowe's, to capture uh, water, rainfall that was coming off of the side of the mountain into buckets that they were then taking home to use that water to cook, to wash their clothes, to shower, and even to boil and then drink it because they said they did not have any access to running water in stores. They're running low on supplies. A lot of people tell us, too, frankly, they feel like they weren't as prepared as maybe they would have been if they'd expected the hurricane to be so catastrophic for the island. But they say they felt like they were told by the government and uh, officials with the energy companies that things were going to be okay with this hurricane. And then ultimately that was not the case. So some people feel like they were caught flat footed to begin with, but getting by, it's a struggle for a lot of people, Joshua. And we know that uh, FEMA did a briefing for President Biden yesterday in terms of the federal aid that's coming. Do we have any sense of when more outside aid is going to come to help out with the cleanup on the ground or are people kind of expecting to be on their own for a while? It's interesting because you have what the government says, what officials on the mainland and here say, and then what people here think. And I've been spending a lot of time trying to really just talk uh, to the people. Our whole team has. And what we keep hearing from a lot of people is that they don't really have a whole lot of faith in the government or the officials when they're saying more money's coming and we're going to use it to do X, Y, and Z because they say, well, look at what happened with Hurricane Maria. Money came in. They said things were going to be changed. We thought X, Y, and Z was going to happen to build back and restore so much of the power grid and they feel like if that any of that had been done in the way that it should have been done that they wouldn't be in this situation right now and you have to remember too there's been a lot of frustration with the main new privatized power company here luma there have been blackouts even before uh hurricane fiona after hurricane maria where there were massive protests this summer because people were so frustrated with the company saying that they are having longer blackouts and then also they're seeing their prices rise so i mean people here are just i think Think fed up across the board and the sense that I get speaking with people is that they don't have a whole lot of faith in anything that officials are saying right now they want to believe it they want to believe that things are going to get better that that fund the funding will come it will be allocated properly and that things will get done but they just seem it it feels like the system has failed them so many times here that it's hard for them to muster a whole lot of faith in it now Joshua yeah, I hear that, Ellison. Thank you very much for your report. Please do stay safe as best you can. That's NBC's Ellison Barber reporting from Bayamon in Puerto Rico. Still to come, we'll have the latest on the mass protests in Iran. People are demanding answers after a young woman died in police custody. Our bureau chief in Iran's capital has the latest. We're glad you're with us for Now Tonight from NBC News. Iran's army is preparing to step up its crackdown on protests there. People took to the streets a week ago after a young woman died in police custody. Authorities accused Masa Amini of not following the strictly enforced dress code. Iranian police claim that she had a pre-existing condition and died of a heart attack. She was 22 years old. Her family denies those claims, and authorities say they're still investigating. Meanwhile, crowds have gathered in more than 90 cities and towns across Iran. State television reports suggest the death toll could be as high as 26 people, but an exact tally remains unclear. And today, the U.S. announced plans to intervene, perhaps where it matters most to the protesters, expanding Internet access to counter a government blackout. NBC's Tehran bureau chief Ali Arouzi has more on all of this. Hey, Ali. 
Hey Joshua, so now this is the seventh night of continual violent protests that have erupted in dozens of cities across Iran and they're not showing any signs of slowing down. Sparked by the death of the 22-year-old woman after she was arrested by the feared morality police for violating the country's strictly enforced Islamic dress code. Masa Amini's death touched a raw nerve in the country and protesters, many of them women, poured out into the streets despite facing a brutal crackdown and an arrest, burning their compulsory hijabs, cutting their hair, supported by large crowds, cheering them on, chanting, woman, life, freedom. The government wants to put an end to this quickly. They've deployed massive security presence across the country. They're asking their supporters to come out onto the streets and show allegiance to the ruling establishment. The internet is all but down, barely working. You can't access search engines or social media and messaging apps are blocked. And most importantly for the authorities, people can't communicate to try and mobilize with one another or upload videos of the rolling crackdown. There's still large crowds protesting protesting across the country, but we're seeing much less videos being put out by them. Uh, and this is straight out of the Islamic Republic's playbook. During times of unrest, they pulled the plug on the internet. In 2019, there were mass protests uh, over a gasoline hike. The government enforced a 10-day internet blackout, and during that period, many protesters were killed. But this time, the U.S. says that they want to help. Secretary Blinken tweeting, we took action today to advance internet freedom and the free flow of information for the Iranian people to provide them with greater access to digital communications to counter the Iranian government censorship. Under Secretary Blinken's tweet, Elon Musk tweeted, activating Starlink. And Joshua, just to bring you up to speed with one more recent development, Iran's interior minister just issued a statement uh, saying that the early stages of an investigation into Amini's death showed that she had not been beaten. So it doesn't look like her family are going to get any accountability. Thank you, Ali. That's NBC Tehran Bureau Chief Ali Aruzi reporting for us tonight. Up next, a look inside Ukraine that perhaps few people live to talk about. Richard Engel takes us inside a makeshift torture center that was used by Russian troops. And you'll meet a Ukrainian man who says he was tortured there. It's a remarkable short documentary, and it's just ahead. Stay close. Russia is putting more political pressure on eastern Ukraine, this time with dubious elections on whether to secede from Ukraine. Today, four Russian-occupied regions held referenda on joining Russia. Those are the ones marked in orange. These elections are illegal under both Ukrainian and international law. Western nations have widely condemned this move, and some Ukrainians say they fear it could lead to further annexation of their country. Russia continues to draft men in an attempt to beef up its military forces. The call for conscripts prompted a mass exodus there. Some men were stuck at the border with Kazakhstan, which is south of Russia, for hours or days. Meanwhile, the troops Russia does have are committing more than their share of atrocities. Today, United Nations experts said Russian soldiers have committed a number of war crimes. Those include indiscriminately raping, torturing, and killing children, some as young as four years old. Officials say they got some of their information from Ukrainians who had been tortured. And now we have a spellbinding new look at what that may have been like. We went inside a police station where Russian soldiers tortured people. Fair warning, you may find it highly disturbing. With tonight's feature report, here's NBC's chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel. Out here in the east, the war has been going exceptionally badly for the Russian army. One of the main Russian front lines collapsed. But as the tide of Russian troops receded, we are now getting a very clear picture of what the Russians were doing during their occupation. We knew what the Russians had been doing in other places. We knew how brutal they were on the outskirts of Kyiv, but the Russians were here for even longer, which means they had time to set up places like this one 
which were designed to torture, designed to interrogate, and designed to terrorize Ukrainians who are under Russian rule. The Russians occupied Izium for months, and one of their main concerns, if not the main concern, was finding out information about the local population so that they could protect themselves. They wanted to make sure that there weren't any soldiers in hiding, anyone passing on information to the Ukrainian army. And in this room, they have all these passports, all the Ukrainian flag, so that the Russians would determine who exactly was under their control, who could be a potential threat, who was serving in the army, who could be part of an underground. And they use just absolutely vicious ways of extracting information. So this man, Maxim here, was tortured in this facility and now he's giving a statement to the prosecutors. He's also looking for his documents, telling them if they come across anything, he's trying to find his paperwork, which the Russians took from him. He says it's difficult for him to remember the exact layout of this place because he was blindfolded, but he remembers walking it. Yeah, here's clearly where the cells were. You're entering into a, a gated area. And this underground area, which is very, very the creepy at the best of times. Four people, four people. There were four people in here. So this underground area is where the Russians and their collaborators kept the political prisoners, the ones the Russians most suspected were working with the Ukrainian army, were intelligence operatives. This was the most secure part of this, this dungeon. I can't think of another way of describing it. So this was your cell down this hallway yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah. This is this, this, this my uh, cell. Uh, Number two? Four, four people. Four, four people inside. Four, four men. Uh, this. So where did you sleep? Here? Yeah. And there? Yeah. And was this terrible bucket, was that toilet? Yes, yes. That was the toilet? Yes. This was the only window, and since we're now below ground, the prisoners and guards upstairs would drop their waste and, and garbage down in here. So this area was full of rats, three rats in particular, and they named them. And that was their only view, was a rat-infested hole with a few glibbers occasionally of light. So this was the torture room. You can tell it just feels like a terrible place. This was originally a target practice area within the police station. You can see they put up some soundproofing and there are these rubber reinforced walls with holes in them. So it was an area that was already built to absorb noise, gunshots, or in this case, screams. I know it must be very painful, but can you, can you tell us what happened to you in here? Меня садили на стул. Садили на стул. Заковывали наручники. Вот так вот. И здесь подсоединяли к пальцам электроды. Электроды. Наверное, это было вот здесь вот был капик. И подсоединяли электроды. И включали ток. Я... Тело начинало судорожно, судорожно от электрических разрядов. И я начинал вырываться инстинктивно. Я скидывал клеммы пальцами. Скидывал клеммы. They have this machine here in this drawer. You're attached to leads. When they don't hear what they like or they want you to be in pain, they turn on the machine, then they turn it off, and they ask you questions. What were they asking you? What do they want to know? 
Ничего не говорили. Мне ничего не говорили. Я пытался с ними поговорить, я у них спрашивал, что вам надо, что вы хотите. Мне отвечали, говори сам, ты знаешь сам, говори сам. They weren't asking questions. They would just tie you up to the electricity, cause you pain, and wait for you to talk yourself. Yeah, yeah. Первые два дня, первые два дня, мне не задавали вопросов, меня просто пытали. На третий день они привели меня на третий день. Они меня посадили точно так же. Они не одевали на меня наручники и сказали: "Ну что, давай поговорим." Нормально, нормально, нормал. And what did they ask you? Когда и кто тебя завербовал в СБУ? Кто твой контакт в СБУ? Кем ты, какую информацию ты передавал? Почему у тебя нашли карты? What did you tell them? Разговор был очень короткий, потому что, во-первых, после двух дней пыток я был в очень плохом состоянии. И у меня шелило сердце, проблемы с дыханием были. Я пытался сказать, что я не причастен ни к чему. И это обычные карты. Did they torture you again after that, or did they leave you alone? What happened next? Я, я, они меня выпустили, и они сказали, что на следующий день мы продолжим наш разговор. Но на следующий день они не приехали, они не приехали еще через день, а потом три дня и нас освободили. Украинская армия наступление и всех освободили. Мне повезло. So this was the electric shock station, chairs around this drawer, and you, you, you said they also had other Oh, this, this bat, this club. Yeah, yeah. This looks like a, an axe handle. They were using this to, uh, to beat people? And what about these masks? So they would put these on your, over your head so that you couldn't breathe. And then, and then just cover, cover the end to make you suffocate. Yeah, yeah, no. Oh, this chain. I don't even like to think about that. What, what was the chain for? Hanging? So this was used for a bastinado, the beating of the bottom of the feet, which is extraordinarily painful. And they would, they would tie them up on the ground so that they could hit, hit the bottom of the feet. Yeah, yeah. So this was not just a whole torture room. There were torture stations. This was like set up with many different areas for different kinds of torture. It was thought out in a way. There was the electricity station over there. There was the hanging hook. I'm trying to imagine what it would have looked like, felt like to be here. Uh, he said because the room was so dark and the, the guards had, a, had these headlights on, you couldn't see their faces. All you could see was the light shining on you. You're in total darkness, you're frightened, you're in pain already, and now there's this light shining on you, and a voice, and you know that they have ill intent and they're gonna do terrible things to you, and all you can see is this one light coming at you. Don't even know exactly what they're, what they're doing, you're blindfolded, you don't know what they have in their hands. Absolutely, absolutely horrendous, horrendous experience in this terrible, terrible place. That was NBC's chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, reporting. Up next, flooding in Pakistan, severe droughts in Africa. We'll see how low-income countries are dealing with our changing climate when we come back.
Much of the world has been dealing with extreme weather events lately, but few countries in South Asia are suffering quite like Pakistan. Historic flooding left nearly a third of the country underwater. More than 33 million people have been affected by the deluge. That's 15 percent of Pakistan's population. Millions have been displaced. Homes and villages and bridges and roads and crops have all been swept away. And currently, the damage is estimated at nearly $30 billion. To make matters worse, diseases like malaria and dengue are now spreading rapidly through the affected areas. The U.N. has reported 44,000 malaria cases just this week in southern Pakistan. Actress Angelina Jolie made a surprise visit there this week. She's visited the country in the past for relief work, but she said that she's never seen anything like this. At this time, we see it's the countries that cause less damage to the environment that are now bearing the brunt of, of the disaster and the, and the pain and, and the death. I think this is a, a real wake-up call to the world about where we are at. Um, the climate change is not only real and it's not only coming, it's very much here. I am uh, overwhelmed, uh, but I don't even feel it's fair to say that because I'm not living this. The floods in Pakistan have highlighted, highlighted a complex issue, how low-income countries that contribute less to climate change are bearing the brunt of its impacts. Take the Horn of Africa, for example, Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia. According to the UN, that region is about to enter a fifth drought season. That's causing nearly 50 million people to suffer from food insecurity. Couple all of this with some precarious political structures, and the future in many of these countries looks iffy at best. Joining us now are Dr. Fora Noreen, Director for Pakistan at Mercy Corps. She's with us from the Pakistani capital of Islamabad. Also with us is Professor Stephen Clemens. He teaches Earth, Environmental, and Planetary Sciences at Brown University. Good to see both of you. And Dr. Noreen, I wonder if I could start with you and how Pakistan is doing right now in terms of just trying to deal with all of these multi-part crises that it's dealing with. Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, Pakistan, uh, 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 the thing is, this uh, disaster unfolded before our eyes over a period of two and a half months. Um, and with with uh, unstoppable uh, rains uh, across the country, but more so in areas uh, which do not see uh, this kind of rain uh, in the monsoons normally. Uh, a lot of other events happened that have really complicated the situation in different parts of the of the country. We cannot say that this is a uniform uh, disaster across the country in each area. Uh, each area has its specific needs. The situation is different, and the and the response uh, to those needs has to be uh, different as well. Uh, in the south, especially, uh, we see a very very large population displaced. Uh, many of them are in organized uh, camps, but uh, a, a, a whole lot of people are uh, pretty much uh, on uh, by themselves in uh, makeshift tents by the sides of the roads or any place where they have found safety. So there's a major, major right. uh, need here right. for immediate relief uh, and also the, uh, the needs that are developing over time. Professor Clemens, tell me your outlook on these kinds of extreme monsoons. You did a study last year about how data from previous eons and millennia point to these kinds of storms getting worse. Is what we're seeing in Pakistan what your data were revealing? Yeah, so the study you're uh, speaking about uh, looked at several hundred thousand years of evolution of the uh, uh, South Asian monsoon system. And in this case, we were able to determine that periods of time in the past where you have increased uh, concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, were similar, uh, were the same times where you had increased rainfall in South Asia. Uh, and we measured that by the uh, looking at the salinity, the runoff of the rib, monsoonal fed rivers into the Bay of Bengal. So yes, these types of uh, increases in monsoonal activity are, are quite consistent across time. Dr. Noreen, talk about how Pakistan gets out of this mess from you know, this literal mess that it's dealing with with these monsoonal floods between what the Pakistani government can do and what other governments need to do. The damage, as we said, is estimated at about 30 billion U.S. dollars right now. How much can we rely on Pakistan to do for itself 
as opposed to how much that other nations might need to provide assistance? The first thing to understand is that this is this is not something that will that can be addressed immediately or in a in a short period of time. I think the world needs to be ready for the fact uh, that uh, following the immediate relief, which of course is the biggest priority right now, uh, the recovery and rehabilitation is going to be a very very long journey, and Pakistan will need support. Uh, even prior to the floods, uh, the country was facing uh, economic um, uh, instability. Uh, right now, uh, the humanitarian organize the government, of course, but also the humanitarian organizations, local uh, uh, organizations, have really mobilized and they're present in those areas and they're trying to respond to the immediate needs of the community. Uh, uh, we're also seeing that after the the initial UN flash appeal, uh, donor money has been mobilized, but but really a lot more is needed uh, to be able to cater to the needs of these populations. And the needs keep on emerging as the as the situation uh, continues. Uh, displacement in major parts of the country, especially in the south, is going to continue for some time. Uh, the water is not receding. It it may take months. Uh, the places where the water has receded, uh, people have started going back uh, to their homes, but they're finding their houses damaged, their livelihoods gone. Uh, so huge needs in those areas as well. Uh, for, for recovery, of course, uh, uh, Pakistan uh, needs to, to, to make efforts, but for sure, uh, there is this need for international aid and also this need for continued attention to this uh, 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 this issue because it has happened this year. Uh, the, the road to recovery is long. It's going to be challenging. It's going to take time, but we don't know what's going to happen uh, in, in the future. The, the, this year's rains have shown the unpredictability of how uh, these climate events can, uh, can take place. Professor Clemens, to that point, what should we be thinking about in terms of recovering from storms like this? I mean, what, what's happening in Pakistan now could very easily be the United States Gulf Coast next time. It could be the Atlantic provinces in Canada this weekend. So there but for the grace of God. But I don't want to have to keep spending the same money over and over to protect people from the impacts of climate change. I'm from South Florida. I've got family within 10 miles of the coast. So I wonder how we plan for the future, whether we plan where we are or whether we plan to get away from where we are because climate change is pushing us away from what are now more dangerous parts of the world. How do we think that through? Well, indeed, Joshua, we, we need to plan for where we are now because there are a great many people living in coastal regions that are at risk. Uh, and uh, we either plan for where we are now or risk mass migrations into, uh, into other regions from peoples near the coast. An example of this idea that we're all in the same boat uh, was right here in our backyard a couple of weeks ago, for example, here in Providence, Rhode Island, we got 10 inches of rain in one day. That is phenomenal for here. Our infrastructure is built to withstand big rains, which were two inches or three inches in a day. So uh, the drainage couldn't handle it. Many of our freeways shut down. It's a microcosm of what's happening in Pakistan, of course, that's much, much worse. Uh, but yeah, so uh, what's happening there should be a wake up call for the remainder of us across the globe. We need to all plan for these types of events to become more impactful and more uh, uh, more common over time. I just want to be clear, Professor, and we're real low on time, but are you saying that we need to plan to harden the areas where we are or plan to get out of those areas and just acknowledge that climate change is going to make them unlivable? Well, it depends on what time you're talking about. If you're talking about uh, flood pains in river valleys, it's really hard to uh, to plan for floods in river valleys like the Indus River Valley, for example. Uh, people live there, they farm there, the infrastructure is there to, to uh, keep the economy going. That's where the water is. So it, at that type of level, one needs to plan for staying there, harden the infrastructure. Dr. Farah Nareen of Mercy Corps and Brown University, Professor Stephen Clemens, I appreciate you talking us through this and walking us through images that we don't often get a lot of context behind. So thank you both very much. We will get to some of tonight's headlines before we go, including calls for change from firefighters battling blazes along the West Coast, speaking of our changing climate, plus a verdict today against a QAnon supporter who attended the January 6th riots,
Before we go, let's get to more of tonight's headlines, beginning with the January 6th prosecutions. Today, a jury found Doug Jensen of Iowa guilty on seven criminal counts. He was among the first people to breach the U.S. Capitol that day. The counts range from civil disorder to obstruction of an official proceeding. Mr. Jensen was among the rioters who chased down Capitol Police Officer Eugene Goodman that day. Officer Goodman testified in the trial this week. Sentencing for Doug Jensen is scheduled for December 16th. More than 850 people have been arrested over the January 6th attacks. Days of rain are partially containing California's largest wildfire right now. The Mosquito Fire has been raging for weeks northeast of Sacramento. It's burned almost 77,000 acres. At last check, it was about 60% contained. As for the firefighters themselves, they're facing a different type of burnout. NBC's Julie Serkin has more on that. Julie, good evening. Good evening, Joshua. We are in yet another devastating wildfire season. More than six and a half million acres burned this year alone, according to the National Interagency Fire Center. But it's the thousands of men and women on the front lines who are burnt out too, mentally, physically, and emotionally. Listen to their stories. Once again, the West is on fire, scorching forests, torching homes, and uprooting lives. But it's the people battling the blaze with the most to say about this worsening global crisis. I always knew there was a big risk of injury, but I just never thought it would happen to me. In May of this year, it did happen to him. After 15 years as a wildland firefighter, smoke jumper Ben Elkind lost control of a new parachute while training. Falling more than 20 feet, but miraculously landing on both feet. One of my legs like popped up and it just kind of broke out the back of my pelvis. Um, and dislocated my femur. For the first summer in a long time, Ben is home on the sidelines as fires ruin the nature that surrounds him. He and his wife, Amber, live here in Oregon with their two toddler boys. When he's gone, I'm responsible for finding childcare and for taking care of our children um, and for working. It feels nearly impossible to try to make all of that work and not have it collapse. But since he can't work, there is no overtime pay, and Ben's family is barely making ends meet. This year, federal wildland firefighters received a temporary pay increase and a minimum wage guarantee of $15 an hour. We'll continue to go to bat. We, we recognize this is not uh, something that we can fix overnight. We really are here for the long run, and we really are listening to our firefighters. It's part of an attempt to reform the current pay structure which Ben says results in astronomical overtime hours, upwards of 1,000 in a single fire season. There's something else the 37-year-old discovered when he underwent a full-body CT scan, a nodule on his thyroid. How did it feel when he called you and told you that he had cancer? We were both pretty shocked about that. And moving forward, it's very difficult to have him continue in smoke jumping or firefighting, yeah. knowing that he's going to have exposure to smoke for another 15 years. This spring, Ben joined a group of firefighters for a meeting with Labor Secretary Marty Walsh. Shortly after that, cancer became a covered illness. Are you not required to get a mandatory check every year for cancer? No, I've never even heard of cancer being brought up, you know, officially at work. Wildland firefighters and their families come together during tough times, raising money and supporting loved ones when tragedy hits. But these grassroots efforts aren't a long-term solution. That's why Michelle Hart, who lost her smoke jumper husband Tim in a New Mexico fire last year, is fighting in Congress for lasting change. If I can make an iota of difference on his behalf for the people that he loved, the people who kept him alive, uh, after he had an accident that I had a chance to say goodbye. I, I owe that to them, and I owe it to him. After having his broken hip pinned in place, Ben's already training for the next fire season. Okay, you, you broke your pelvis, you've got cancer. Um, I don't really have any other option. I, I'm going to go back to work, and I'm going to keep being exposed to more smoke. Are you concerned or hesitant that Ben will have to return to a job that put his life in danger? Yes. I am very, very hesitant um, after this experience. It was really eye-opening about what can happen. 
And Joshua, you heard a little bit about the work that Washington and Congress is doing to address some of these issues. But in my conversations with the men and women battling these fires, they say it's just not enough. There is more that needs to be done to address some of the concerns that they're facing. And why should Americans care about this? Well, there are more than eight massive fires burning right now across the West. And a lot of these states are actually reporting firefighter shortages. Definitely something Americans should care about. Thank you, Julie. That was NBC's Julie Serkin reporting from Capitol Hill. The midterm elections are almost here, and the economy is a huge issue for many voters. For some, that includes student loan debt, and that is a unique issue for many students at historically black colleges and universities. MSNBC's Tremaine Lee is traveling to HBCUs across the South for his podcast series on the power of the black vote. This week, he reports for us from North Carolina. Growing up, Jonah Vincent always knew he was going to college. Everyone in my family, on my mom's side, they all went to uh, Southern in Baton Rouge. My dad went to college, my uncles all went to college on my dad's side. It's family tradition, but also so much more. For African Americans, higher education is a rebuke of a history that legally barred black folks from learning to read or write, let alone go to college. So Jonah pursued two degrees, both from historically black colleges. But now, a decade after graduating, Jonah, who works for a nonprofit, still owes $120,000 in student loans that he can't afford to pay, especially as a new dad. I'm looking at her and I'm like, man, she can be anything that she wants to be. And as soon as I said it to myself, I'm like, oh man, do, do, can we afford to put her through college? Because black students arrive on campus with less wealth than their white peers, they tend to take out more and bigger loans for the same degrees. And they'll owe about $7,400 more than their white counterparts at graduation. It's one reason Jonah founded NoCap, an organization that mobilizes black students, especially on HBCU campuses, around pivotal issues like canceling student loan debt. Specifically for black people, it looks like modern day uh, sharecropping. We'll give you the opportunity to become something, but in order for you to do that, you gotta borrow this from us and it's gonna travel through your family for the rest of your time if you never pay us off. Yeah. We visited his alma mater, North Carolina Central University, to talk to current students like Mark Way Spencer Gibbs, who owes $38,000, and Heaven Smith, who owes $100,000, about the debt they face. So there was no college fund for you? There wasn't a fund, but there wasn't any, like, oh, I'm not going to help you pay for it. I wonder if this issue would make you change who you're voting for. It definitely will be a major factor in my decision, um, but there are definitely other factors as well. President Biden announced a student debt relief plan that the White House says could impact 43 million Americans and eliminate debt for 20 million people. It's about opportunity. It's about giving people a fair shot. It's the fulfillment of a campaign promise, but for these students, it's not enough. It's cute, like thanks, but what's next? Because 20,000 on 100 is, what's that? Despite the heavy burden of student loan debt, these students are determined to pursue their dreams no matter what. Can definitely relate to the debt. That was MSNBC's Tremaine Lee reporting. And hey, check out his reporting on black voters on the latest episode of his podcast, Into America. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast app. And thank you for making time for us. We'd love to hear from you on anything we cover tonight. We're at NBC Now tonight on social media. We'll post that short documentary. Please share it around. Feel free to leave us a voicemail, 888-575-2NBC, or email now tonight at NBCNews.com. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. We'll see you Monday. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.